Well, hello, good evening. Welcome again to Ask Your Pastor here on Whisper with Hope. We are so glad you have taken the time out to join us again as we continue to explore the book of Galatians. Tonight, we are looking at chapter 3, verses 1 to 6. Promises to be another thought-provoking, a transforming study. So, as usual, we invite you to invite a friend, call them up, share the link, and let them know that Ask Your Pastor is on. We are studying through the book of Galatians. Uh, again, we want to thank you for tuning in week after week and uh, supporting us with your comments, your questions. Remember, as usual, if you have a question, please post it in the chat, or if you have a comment, we'd be happy to see it also. We'll do our best to try and answer it for you. Well, Pastor Peters and I, we have been going through this book, and tonight Pastor Peters is again in the hot seat, and he is going to be leading us through our study. So, Pastor P, would you greet the folk and then lead us into a word of prayer? Blessings in abundance, everybody. I pray that you've been enjoying the grace of God. I pray that you've been basking in the grace of God, the love of Jesus Christ, manifested for us on Calvary's cross, a redemption given to mankind, a redemption that we receive by faith, the faith granted to us by God himself. And so I greet you in the precious name of Jesus Christ. I pray that you, we continue to grow together in the grace of Jesus Christ, in the knowledge of Jesus Christ, and in our relationship with Jesus Christ, I invite you to pray with us. Father, we thank you for your loving kindness. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercies that are new every morning. As we come together in these holy hours, we pray that your Holy Spirit would open before us the beauty of your word. May we come to understand the treasures of your kingdom, and may we come into a fresh encounter with Jesus Christ and appreciate his righteousness. This we thank you for in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen and amen. Galatians chapter 3 verses 1 to 6 is our uh, passage of study for tonight under the caption, Bewitched, Bamboozled, or Beguiled. Bewitched, Bamboozled, or Beguiled. Remember, we are studying through the book of Galatians, only one gospel. There is only one gospel. That's the big theme. Tonight, we come to chapter 3, verses 1 to 6, and we're looking at bamboozled, beguiled, or bewitched. And so, please join us. Pastor P, we're going to read the passage of Scripture. And so, I would ask that you read the first three verses, and then I will read the second three. O foolish Galatians, who have bewitched you that you should not obey the truth, before whose eyes Jesus Christ has been evidently set forth, crucified among you. This only would I learn of you. Received ye the Spirit by the works of the law, or by the hearing of faith? Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, are you now made perfect by the flesh? Have you suffered so many things in vain? If it be in vain, ye therefore that ministereth to you the Spirit, and worketh miracles among you, doeth he it by the works of the law, or by the hearing of faith? Even as Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him for righteousness. Amen and amen. Galatians chapter 3 verses 1 to 6. Well, Pastor P, as usual, we like to recap what we would have studied last week. And so, please go right ahead and let's see how it dovetails into what we're going to study this week. Well, Paul is about to transition from what we looked at from last week. He actually got into the heart of the gospel. What is the gospel? He presented the, the principles of being crucified in Christ from verse 20 of chapter 2. And in fact, he began all the way in verse 16, presenting the idea that salvation is a completed gift given by God through Jesus Christ. And he made two major points in those verses. One, nothing can be added to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Paul is saying to the Galatians, you can't add your good works to that which God has already completed. It's already done. And two, neither can you take away. You can take away the merits of Jesus to add your good works. 
after having established that, what the gospel is, that it is Jesus Christ and him crucified, and what God has accomplished in Christ, the crucifixion of mankind through Christ and the resurrection to life through Christ. Paul now from verse 3 is about to apply that truth. He doesn't just set forth the truth of what the gospel is. Now he wants the believer to apply the truth to their life and see how the gospel is going to make changes in their lives. Amen. Amen. Amen, Pastor P. And so the Galatians, having heard the teaching, having understood the teaching about the gospel of grace or salvation in Christ Jesus, having received it, having believed it, having received eternal life, or being born again, were being tempted to pull away from that. And so, having concluded his address to Peter, as we would say, Pastor P, he now turns his attention back to the Galatian. And again, we see some strident language coming out, Pastor P. Oh, foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. Pastor, let's talk about the tone again. It's one of incredulity. I, I cannot believe this must be somebody working uh, witchcraft on you, so to speak. I don't think there is another verse of scripture like Galatians chapter 3 verse 1. From a pastoral point of view, just imagine you're at church, and your pastor addresses the congregation that way. It would be the end of his career. Somebody would stone him. Somebody would call headquarters. You know, our pastor has gone out of his mind. He is insulting the church. And the language that Paul uses is the worst that a pastor could actually address the church with. He's calling the people foolish, ignorant, without wisdom. You are worse than children. And in fact, we are going to see this as we go into chapter 4. The way that he continues to, to hammer this down and to paint the picture that this is the worst decision that any human being can ever make. It is so beyond comprehension that you have to actually be foolish to do that. And he uses language like bewitched. I mean, this is a word that Paul pulls out of the Old Testament. Paul is saying some witchcraft, something has been done to you to cover your eyes. Somebody gave you something to drink or you ate something that you should not have eaten and you have no control over your senses. You get paid on Friday and before Saturday night comes, you're broke because you just wasted your money. You made some foolish mistakes. You made some foolish decisions. And this is the picture that Paul is painting here for the Galatians. And in there, every statement of verse 1 is loaded. He calls them foolish. He says, you are bewitched. This is sorcery. This is obia. The obia man work on you and was successful because the decision that you're about to make is beyond comprehension. It, it is out of order. It is out of character with the kingdom of God. But Paul makes another beautiful statement there. He says at the end of verse three, let me take the full verse. Oh, foolish Galatians who have bewitched you that you should not obey the truth. But he says, you Galatians, before whose eyes Jesus Christ has been evidently set forth, crucified among you. Now, when you think of this, the book of Galatians was written almost about four, five, or six decades after the crucifixion of Jesus. The Galatians were not there. Paul himself wasn't there. He wasn't an eyewitness to the crucifixion or the resurrection. Yet Paul makes a statement to the Galatians. When the gospel was preached, you heard the gospel you saw the truth of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. And although you were not an eyewitness, through the eyes of faith, you saw Jesus crucified. Not just crucified, but resurrected for you. And you have almost become an eyewitness of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. And so for someone to turn you away from that, there must be some kind of witchcraft and obia involved. That's deep. That's deep, Pastor. And again, you mentioned it and we go back to it. Who has bewitched you? Who has pulled that wool over your eye and bamboozled you that you should not obey the truth? So again, 
he expresses, he makes known that his ultimate intention is that the people should abide in the truth of the gospel and not be bewitched by any concoction or any addition or subtraction to that gospel of Jesus Christ. Indeed, indeed. In fact, many Bible scholars believe that when Paul wrote that statement in verse number one of chapter three, that Paul was actually thinking about the Old Testament Saul. Paul is the New Testament Saul, whose mm. name was changed to Paul. And Bible scholars are saying when Paul made that statement, he was actually thinking historically of the Old Testament Saul, who went to the witch of Endor, and she brought up in his mind the prophet Samuel. And the Bible tells us that Saul actually believed that he was talking to the Old Testament prophet who was already dead. He was talking to his spirit, whatever. And the Bible is saying to us, for you to believe that, this is the condition under which you believe that you are actually talking to someone who is dead. This is witchcraft. This is voodoo. This is obia. And in order for Saul to have believed that, he went to the witch of Endor. And Paul is saying to believe another gospel is equivalent to believing that you can speak to the dead. It's witchcraft. Wow. Somebody has to fool you. Deep indeed, Pastor. And let's explore a little further that statement that you alluded to and get to its meaning. Because as you said, every phrase of this passage is loaded. Before whose eyes Jesus Christ had been publicly set forth crucified among you. The implications of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ insofar as they being born again and receiving the gift of eternal life, Pastor. Could you expound on that and in the context of what Paul is saying here for us? Remember, Paul is presenting this following or leading on from what he presented in chapter 2. The implications of the death of Christ. That when Christ was crucified, the sins of the world were paid for. The human race who was in Christ was also crucified with Christ. And by extension, we saw from Ephesians chapter 2 verse 5, we were resurrected or given life, quickened together with Christ. Paul is saying here, look at this. When the gospel was presented to you, the gospel is Jesus Christ and him crucified. So to accept the gospel is to accept a historical fact. And that historical fact is the crucifixion and by extension, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so every believer, every born again believer would by faith been taken to Calvary, stood at the foot of Calvary, looked up by faith and would have seen Jesus hanging on a cross being crucified for the sins of the world, for the redemption of the world, and for the salvation of the world. So when we accept the death, burial, and resurrection, when we accept Jesus, we are accepting that. We are accepting the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ for salvation. Now to go to any other means to earn salvation is to say, that which I saw with my own eyes by faith was not real. It was a mirage. It was fake news. Jesus wasn't crucified. Jesus wasn't resurrected. Jesus did not ascend. And therefore, I need to find another means of salvation. And that's why the preaching of the gospel, Paul says in Romans chapter 1, the preaching of the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. There is no other means of salvation other than the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is Jesus Christ and him crucified, Jesus Christ, the resurrected Savior. And Amen. that's the power that the Galatians are walking away from. And you have to be foolish. You have to be bewitched to walk away from such a power, the power of God. Amen. Because not only is it an historical and accomplished fact, but it is also a fact that that which that act was intended to accomplish has been fully accomplished and stands accomplished to this day. If it were not accomplished, Jesus would not have returned back to earth on the resurrection morning. If we follow the chronology of events, Jesus comes from the grave, he encounters Mary. Mary met him there. She thought he was the gardener. And when she recognized it was Jesus, she clinged to Jesus. She 
took hold of him. And Jesus says, the New Testament says, the King James Bible says, don't touch me. But it was more than just a touch. She grabbed onto Jesus. And so the Greek text says, don't hold me back. Don't prevent me. Prevent me from what? That same morning, Jesus goes to his father, presented himself as the sacrifice for the human race, presented himself as the redemption of the human race, presented himself as the sacrifice, presented himself as the all and in all for mankind. God accepted that sacrifice. Isaiah chapter 53 tells us, he shall see the travail of his soul and he shall be satisfied. God was satisfied with the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And it is because of the satisfaction that God experienced that Jesus was allowed to come back to earth. Praise so the he, Lord. Came, he came back to earth to declare all power is given unto me. Hallelujah. And that's the salvation. That's the redemption that God has called us to present to a world that is dying in sin. Amen. Hallelujah, Pastor P. Praise the Lord. And I can't help but see shades and tones and, and type meeting anti-type in this section when we turn back to that famous story in Numbers chapter 21. Mm. You remember, Pastor P., which reads Numbers 21, 4 to 9, the children of Israel, they're traveling through the wilderness on their way to the promised land. But they're full of complaint and murmuring. And verse 4 says, And they journeyed from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to compass the land of Edom. And the soul of the people was much discouraged because of the way. And the people spake against God and against Moses. Wherefore have ye brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no bread, neither is there any water, and our soul loatheth this light bread. Well, the Lord sent fiery serpent among the people, and they bit the people, and much people of Israel died. Therefore, the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against thee. Pray unto the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. And Moses prayed for the people. And watch this, Pastor P. And the Lord said unto Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent, and set it upon a pole. And it shall come to pass that everyone that is bitten on the, on the way to death, when he looketh, when he seeth upon it, shall live. And Moses made a serpent of brass and put it upon a pole. And it came to pass that if a serpent had bitten any man, when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. Pastor P, connect the two for us here. And that's, um, that's yes. the gospel being preached in the Old Testament. This is so beautiful. God did such a marvelous and outside of human comprehension thing. The most popular animal used in the Bible to portray Jesus is a lamb. God did not ask Moses to hang a, a lamb on the pole. God told Moses, build a serpent, make a brazen serpent, a symbol of the very thing that's causing death. A symbol of the thing that has brought death and pain and destruction. And that serpent, that brazen serpent that Moses built represents Jesus Christ. And so in his conversation with Nicodemus in John chapter 3, Jesus says to Nicodemus, just as Moses lifted the serpent in the same way that Moses lifted the serpent, Jesus is going to be hanging on the cross and he has become the embodiment of sin. He has taken upon himself the sins of the world. Isaiah 53 says to us, the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. When Jesus hung on the cross, Paul says, God made him to be sin for us who knew no sins. And so Jesus has received every dredge of the penalty of sin. He takes upon himself all the consequences of sins, the death, the separation from God, because he has taken upon himself the sins of the world. So look at this, look at this, look at this. Paul is saying the Galatians were looking back at a crucified savior. The children of Israel in the wilderness were looking forward to a crucified savior. The same way the Galatians by faith saw a crucified savior, so too the children of Israel by faith saw a crucified savior before whose eyes Jesus was crucified. And it is by the same faith 
in a crucified Savior that we have salvation. By no other means, by no other way, but by a crucified Savior who took upon himself the sins of the world, died our death, and gave us his eternal life. Amen, Pastor P. And to think that we would be bamboozled, bewitched, a beguiled to such an extent that such a great work, such a marvelous atoning sacrifice accomplishing for us, as you say, the foolishness of it, so to speak, as Paul refers to it, the foolishness of the cross. You know, it's an offense to the Jews who desire a sign and foolishness to the Greeks who search for wisdom. But that crucifixion, it is in dying, <laughs> in the dying out of the dying that comes forth life to us. And to think that the false teachers would be so cunning in their little spin on the gospel, just here in the context of Galatian, adding circumcision, adding the observance of certain rituals to it, to think of the, the depth of what they're trying to say about Christ and about his finished work, it, it's almost unthinkable. It's difficult to fathom passage. Possibly. Yes, indeed, because as Paul said in, in the ending of chapter 2, it's like trying to undo what God has done. It's like trying to undo creation. That's what evolution is trying to do. Undo creation. That's impossible. And to seek to be saved by any other means other than Jesus Christ is, is trying to do the same thing. Trying to undo Calvary. And Paul is saying that that's impossible. It's already a completed action. It's already It has already been accepted by the Father. It's too late. <laughs> it's too late to try to be saved any other way. Amen. So stop being bewitched. Stop being bamboozled. Stop being beguiled. And the way you do that is to go back to Calvary. Go back to the crucifixion. Go back to what Christ has accomplished. And plant your flag there. Don't be removed from that at all. That is your only hope. That is your only standing. But Pastor P, he continues because he has more. Now he's going to appeal to their personal experience of salvation, of how they got this new life. I like verse 2. Pastor P, I want you to read that with the emphasis and the pathos with which Paul comes at it. Yes, For sure. He asks this beautiful question in verse 2. He says, This only would I learn of you. Did you receive the Holy Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Wow. And this has to be a mind-boggling question because it causes you to think. It causes you to go back to the point of your salvation. When you first receive salvation, you have to begin to think about that. Was I really saved? Because you're asking the question, was I really saved when I accepted Jesus? Now to say no is to doubt Jesus Christ himself. Because Jesus says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. So if you believed and you did not receive salvation, then the problem is not you. The problem is Jesus because you were acting on Jesus' word. That, that's deep, Pastor P. You need to say that again. You need, you need to say that again. Yes. yes, indeed, indeed. And I want us as Christians to, we really have to get this. If we don't get this, we're going to be here on this earth another thousand years suffering in sin. Because until we understand the gospel of Jesus Christ, Nothing can go out into the world. Jesus says this gospel of the kingdom must be preached. And Paul is saying this here. And, and think about this as we read verse 2 again. Mm -hmm. Paul is saying to the Galatians, this one thing I want to learn from you. Did you receive salvation? Did you receive the Holy Spirit by the mm -hmm. works of the law mm -hmm. or by faith? And Paul wants the Galatians to go back to the point at which they accepted Jesus Christ. Remember, the accepting of Jesus Christ comes with the gift of the Holy Spirit. It is a gift, and there is nothing that we can do to earn a gift. It has to be a free will gift. And Paul, is, Paul wants them to think about this. In the background of, do I have to be circumcised, which is the works of the flesh, to be saved? And he takes them back to the point of their salvation. When you receive the Holy Spirit at justification, did you receive him because you did some good thing or simply because you believed in Jesus? The answer is simple. You believed in Jesus. And Paul wants the Christian to go back to the principles of salvation by grace through faith in Christ alone this is the foundation of the kingdom of god and no other foundation can be laid except that which is laid by jesus christ himself 
Pastor P, then would I be stretching it too much if I say that receiving the Spirit and being born again, having the life of Christ now enter into you, are analogous terms? Yeah, indeed. I spoke to a young lady a few weeks ago, and she was saying to me, the evidence that she has, that she received the Holy Spirit, is that she was able to speak in tongues. And she went on to say, anyone who, who does not speak in tongues does not have the Holy Spirit. Well, that conflicts with what Jesus says and with what Paul is saying here. Paul is not saying, Paul did not say, did you speak in tongues by faith or by works? He says, did you receive the Holy Spirit? So the point at which a person receives salvation is the point at which he receives the Holy Spirit. The point at which you accept Jesus Christ, that's salvation. That's justification. The point of justification is the point at which you receive the Holy Spirit. And mm -hmm. that's why salvation is by grace and not by works. We cannot do anything to prove to God that we are worthy of the Holy Spirit. We receive the Holy Spirit as a gift from God at the point of our salvation. So every believer, Elder Kemp, Every believer who has been justified, who is in relationship with Jesus, has the Holy Spirit dwelling in him. Ah, this is so deep, Pastor P, because one of the truths that we need to understand is that when we are born again, when we are saved by the Spirit of the living God, it's not just a statement, but it is the very life of God now that has entered into us by and through the Spirit. Because again, Paul reminds us that the letter killeth, but the Spirit gives life, Pastor P. And Amen. you're so right. Ephesians 1, 13 reminds us, in him you also, when you heard the word of truth, there is the time factor, Pastor P. At the point that you heard and believe and receive the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Notice how he's multiplying these phrases Pastor P, to make it clear, and believed in him, Ephesians 1, 13, you were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. You, you can't get away from that, Pastor P. And it's just so powerful. Acts, another chapter and verse that supports that says, and God, who knows the heart, bore witness to them by giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did to us when they believed. This was Peter reporting on the Gentiles' experience as he started to preach to them, and they believed the word of truth, the gospel of salvation. At that moment, they received the Holy Spirit. They entered into eternal life. God's resurrection, eternal life, now enters into them, Pastor P. The same resurrection power. The same power of God that brought Jesus out of the grave, out of the tomb. That power now dwells in the believer. And, and this is one thing that Christians, as Christians, we need to understand. The implications of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now that we have been reconciled to God, now that we have accepted Jesus as our Savior, automatically, right away, we are given the gift of the Holy Spirit. We have not done anything good there is nothing good in us other than the fact that we have accepted Jesus Christ and his righteousness. And immediately we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And Ephesians tells us that God seals us to himself through that Holy Spirit. Praise God. That's why we are saved by grace through faith, not of works. Because if it were of works, none of us would have received the Holy Spirit. We are not good enough. <laughs> Oh, Pastor P, this is so amazing. And it takes us right back to that great nighttime rendezvous with Nicodemus in which mm. Jesus himself is teaching about justification by faith and the new birth. And again, in verse 5, he says unto Nicodemus, to Nicodemus' question, how can a man be born again when he's old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? <laughs> That's the law. Pastor, yes. <laughs> Jesus answered and said, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. He cannot be born again. Why? That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. So, Paul is making a very important point here, following on what Jesus has taught. And it is the spirit 
that brings life. And that comes as a result of us having faith, the faith of Jesus in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And pastor, there can never be an intertwining of those two. The flesh life, the works life can never bring the life of Jesus Christ. It is always by the spirit that comes by faith in Jesus Christ. And just as we receive that, when we are born again, it is by that same faith, by the power of the Holy Spirit, that we must continue to walk. Amen. Amen. It's the same power that gives us life, the same power that sustains that life as we walk in the Spirit. Ah, powerful, Pastor P. Powerful. So, you know, Paul is not done yet because I, I see his eyebrows being raised here, Pastor. <laughs> <laughs> I see we're catching a little bit of the, the, <laughs> the tone of it here. <laughs> <laughs> yes, man. Yes, man. Yes, yes. So, so Pastor, he asks another question. He continues in verse 3. He continues in verse 3, Pastor. And I wonder if you'll read that again, Pastor, and let's go at it again. For mm -hmm. sure. He says, mm -hmm. are you so foolish? Wow. Having begun in the spirit, are you now made perfect by the flesh? So wow. look at this. He asks a question in verse 2. When did you receive the Holy Spirit? Was it when you believed or was it when you were? Before giving them even a chance to give an answer, he gives them the answer in verse 3. He says in verse 3, when you be gone, you be gone by the Spirit. Don't even think about it that you started by the flesh. No, you started in the Spirit. Having begun in the Spirit, do you not want to continue in the flesh? And that is the danger. That is it. Look at it. How were you born again? How did you come into this eternal life? How did you come into the spirit of the living God? It was by faith. And so does it make sense now that you're thinking that you can now go to law keeping works of the law to sustain this spiritual life? It's really a logical question, Pastor. But in the tone, it is as if you're being illogically illogical. In, in, in the sense. Because he, he wants the Galatians to realize how foolish they are. Yeah. He wants them to realize that they are making a grave mistake. They are going to do something that's going to lead them to it, into eternal death. Amen. Because Amen. the flesh profits nothing. The flesh only leads to death. So if you want to depend on the flesh for salvation, you will end up dying in sin. Amen. Amen. And pastor, you know, it is so important that we understand what God is doing with us, having saved us. Because if we miss this, pastor, and I'm going to ask you to let me indulge by going to Romans chapter 8 and look at that great verse. If you will find it with me, pastor, Romans chapter 8, I think it's verse 29, where Paul here is talking and he's saying, for whom he did foreknew, he also predestinated to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. So people think of salvation of something that is just, oh, you're forgiven of your sin now. You no longer have to bear the penalty and that's it. But that's far from it because here is the end goal predestinate, conform, determined beforehand to be conformed to the image of his son, to have the very life, to be like Jesus. That is his goal, that he might be the firstborn among the brethren. Do you think that we are able to arrive at this state by our own effort? This is a spiritual thing. It was by the Spirit that Jesus lived his life while he was here on the flesh because he, he put down his, his divine prerogative and it was by the spirit in him, Pastor, that he lived out that life and it is by the same spirit. If we are ever to be conformed to the image of God, or as Paul puts it over in, in Corinthians 3.13, we are being transformed from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the living God, as we gaze upon the beauty of Jesus. Pastor, sure. your, your comments on that. Yes. For sure. And when we look into the original Greek for the mode of these, these verbs, they are in the mode that says the action is being done to the person. So you are not transforming yourself, you are being transformed. 
You are being worked into the image of God. And so when the believer accepts Jesus Christ, it's the beginning of a beautiful journey. It's not a journey that's, that's going to be without its challenges. It's not going to be without pain and suffering sometimes. But that journey is a beautiful walk as the believer learns to trust in Jesus, as the believer learns to submit to the Holy Spirit. As Paul, we're going to look at this later on, as Paul says, learning to walk in the Spirit. And this is something that God has to do in the life of the believer. This is something that God has to do on the believer, but it takes the believer's submission his cooperation with the Holy Spirit, but never should it ever come into our mind that we can do this ourselves. It cannot be done. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. Well, he's not done talking about the experience, Pastor. So he's talked about the experience of being born again when they got the Holy Spirit. Have you? Did you get it? Have, did, did you start by the, by the works of the flesh? All by the works of the faith. Now, verse 4 is a very practical question. Have you suffered so many things in vain, if it be yet in vain? Because they had, as being part of the Christian church, they had suffered persecution as well. Yeah. So Paul is saying, listen, if I'm just going to go to the physical, yeah. you were persecuted. You suffered persecution for Christ. Did you suffer that persecution in vain? Because the only reason you suffered persecution is because you were in relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, if you want to be circumcised to be saved, it means that you suffered persecution for nothing. You could have been saved from that persecution. And so Paul is trying every single argument that could possibly come to his mind to let the Galatians realize, listen, you're really doing a, a foolish thing. Absolutely. Absolutely, Pastor P. And, you know, a point of this, Pastor P., and you put it so brilliantly, so, so powerfully to us, is that when you decide to hold to the gospel of the teaching of the kingdom of Jesus Christ, which is the grace, you are saved by grace through faith in Christ. He has become our Lord, our substitute and stuff like that. It engenders, it brings in persecution. You may have to find yourself stand alone because this truth, this gospel truth, that Paul preached. And that's why Paul was so persecuted. It didn't leave much room. It didn't leave any room, wiggle room for adding or subtracting. And when you hold to the tenant of it, when you take it to its logical conclusion and explore its implication, you are going to be persecuted for it. Yeah. Yes, indeed. In one way or the other. Yeah either the physical persecution that, that the church faced mm -hmm. in the early Christian church or during the dark ages, mm -hmm. or being maligned, being talked about, being forsaken by friends. Yeah. You, you may find yourself standing alone at home, in the workplace, or even in the church, in the congregation. You are the lone voice on the principles of righteousness by faith because sometimes it's so difficult for others to grasp. The simplicity of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Powerful, Pastor P. Powerful. But then we must stand. Stand, we must stand, the Lord says, you know. So now he's taking it up a notch, Pastor P. I love these questions. Now he's asking it from God's perspective. The one who did the work of saving you. The one who did the work of reforming you. He, therefore, verse 5, that ministered to you the Spirit, Lord of mercy, Pastor P. Look at that. He that ministereth to you the Spirit and worketh miracles around you, doeth he it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Was it in response to your works of the law that he ministered this Spirit to you or work, or was it when you put faith in him? Pastor P, go right ahead. Now, when you think of what the works of the law are, they are actually good things. Yeah. Obedience. That's right. Being a nice person, a kind person. Seeing someone who is without food and you feed that person. Seeing someone who is naked and you give them something to put on their back. Homeless and you give them shelter. All the good things that the Christians are supposed to do. And Paul is saying, did you receive the Holy Spirit from God? Did God give you his Holy Spirit because you were kind, because you were loving, because you thought you did good works of the law? The miracles that God performed among you, healing the sick, raising the dead, all the mighty miracles that God performed. Did he do those things because of good works on your part 
or because of faith in you? When we take those questions apart and seek to answer them, the only truthful answer is that God was able to do those things because of faith. Even Jesus, many times when he healed, he said, your faith has made you whole. Go Amen. and sin no more. Your faith has healed you. Your faith has made you whole. Jesus is able to work through us and do the things that he wants to do in our lives because of faith. Amen. Amen. And so the implication, as you have said, stop being beguiled. Stop allowing people to pull the wool over your eyes and go back to trusting in Jesus Christ. Go back to righteousness by faith. Go back to clinging to him. But he's not done yet, Pastor P. He's not done yet. Because again, as you say, he's piling up the evidence, he's piling up the reasons for them to come out, to snap out of that, that stuff. And to, you know, be anchored in their faith in Jesus Christ. So now he turns to Abraham, <laughs> the father of faith, the father of the Jewish nation. Verse 6, even as Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Pastor P. And I, over against that, we want to read Romans chapter 4, verse 11, Pastor P, if you have that. So here now he brings Abraham into the equation. He's now calling for backup. He's yeah. now calling for some for some assistance. And he calls on, you play tag? No, Paul has tagged in Abraham. He said, Abraham, come, come explain this thing to them. He takes these readers, the Galatians, back into an Old Testament encounter between God and Abraham. Abraham has been considered the father of the faithful, the father of faith, not just for the Christian, but for the Jewish faith as well. And Paul is recounting Abraham's history to make a significant point. Now remember the context here is circumcision and the implications of being circumcised. Well, Paul now calls as a witness, he calls to the witness stand Abraham and let's ask Abraham some questions. Abraham was the first to be circumcised after his encounter with Hagar, the birth of Ishmael, God instructed Abraham to be circumcised. Abraham is circumcised. Paul has Abraham on the witness stand, as it were, for argument's sake. And we ask Abraham, Abraham, when were you counted righteous? When did God declare you righteous? Was it before your circumcision or after your circumcision? And Abraham cries out, I was counted righteous when I believed God, when I believed God's word, when God says, get up, go to a country that I'm going to show you. Abraham believed God. God said, I'm going to make a mighty nation out of you. Abraham believed God. And the Bible says when Abraham believed God, Abraham was declared righteous by God. And that is almost what? 20, 30, about 40 years almost between 30 and 40 years before he was circumcised. Abraham was already declared righteous and the condition under which he was considered righteous was his faith in the word of God, his faith in Jehovah, his belief in Jehovah for who Jehovah was. Amen. Amen. Uh, Pastor P, that is so powerful. And I know we got to read some of that reference passage that you just referenced Romans chapter 4, you know, for instance, verse 3. For what said the scripture? Abraham believed God. Uh, let me back up verse 1 because I, I think it's so powerful to set. Yes, the indeed. Yes, indeed. Yes, yes, indeed. Yes, again, remember he just been concluding there in chapter 3, verse 20. All are on the sin. You know, there is none justified. But then in verse 21, he brings on the gospel and he gets to the heart of it in verse 24, where we are all justified freely by the redemption that is in Christ Jesus through faith. And then he poses that series of questions. Now he says, what shall we say then that Abraham, our father, as pertaining to the flesh, had found? <laughs> Very interesting phrase, Pastor P. As yeah. pertaining to the flesh, had found. For if Abraham were justified by works of the flesh, again, he had whereof to glory, but not before God. For what said the scripture? Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Wow, Pastor P. And then to your question, we're coming down now in verse 9. 
commit this blessedness then upon this blessedness being counted righteous by God as Abraham was declared when he believed God. Commit this blessedness then upon the circumcision only or upon the uncircumcision also. For we say that faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. Verse 10, how was it then reckoned when he was in circumcision or in uncircumcision? The answer, not in circumcision, but in uncircumcision. So why then did he receive circumcision? And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of that which he had before he was circumcised, a seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had yet been uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all them that believe, though they be not circumcised, that righteousness, hallelujah to the Lamb of God, might be imputed unto them also. Pastor P? Yes. Abraham was 75 years old ah. when he was declared righteous by God. Yeah. When he believed God's word yes. and God declared him righteous because of his faith in God. Mm -hmm. Abraham was 99 years old when he was circumcised. Can you imagine this? And Paul could not find a better explanation, a better witness on the witness stand than Abraham. Because in Abraham, we see the beautiful balance between the two. And Paul is saying Abraham's circumcision was simply a sign that he was already declared righteous. It was not the means of his righteousness. Therefore, Galatians, you cannot go to circumcision to be made righteous when Abraham received circumcision as a sign that he was righteous. And he's saying to them, you're mixing up the entire thing. Absolutely. Your salvation and your righteousness is a gift that comes from God through faith, not by works of the law. Powerful. And remember again, Pastor P, the context Having begun in the spirit, are you now trying to perfect yourself by works of the, the law? That is such a powerful context for us to, to keep in mind, Pastor P, won't you say? For sure. And even the life of Abraham is testament to that. Mm -hmm. When God instructed Abraham to be circumcised, nowhere in the conversation did God say to Abraham, you are going to become more righteous when you are circumcised. Mm -hmm. He did not say to Abraham, you will be saved because you are circumcised. God says to him as a token, as a sign, as evidence that you've been made righteous, I'm going to circumcise. You're going to be circumcised. Amen. And we should never, in the proclamation of the gospel, even the, the beautiful balance between faith and law, the way we present law keeping, the moral law, has to be in the context of righteousness by faith. Anytime it is outside of the context of righteousness by faith, law keeping becomes a means of salvation and not a token or the evidence of our salvation. Amen. Well put. I am amazed, Pastor P, at the wisdom and knowledge and just mysterious ways of God that he would cause Abraham's experience to be set forth before us. Things to happen to Abraham. He declared him righteous because he believed him. How many years before he was circumcised, Pastor? That's what, what, 25 years? Yeah. 25 years? Yeah. He set it aside and he put that on, and he had that so that Paul could go back to it. And he has placed that on record so that we today, we today can go back to that and understand that what God did in terms of justifying this man occurred as a gift because he believed in what God has done. And it is the same with us today. We believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ. John 3, 16 could not ring more clearly. For whosoever believeth on him should not perish but have everlasting life. And may this become everything. Yeah. As everyday Christians, as preachers, as evangelists, may the gospel of Jesus Christ, the beauty of the gospel be that which pushes us, that which Paul himself says, 
All I want to know from among you is Jesus Christ and him crucified. Paul was only interested in the proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And may that be our song by today, the gospel Amen. of Jesus Christ. Amen. And you know, Pastor Pete, we, we wanted to make a point there in verse 3. And I'm going to go over it again and allow you to bring in those two scriptures, Philippians 1, 6, and also Hebrews 3, 14. Because it is germane to the issue that we're discussing. Having begun in the spirit, are you now trying to perfect yourself by work of the law? Are you so foolish? Verse 3 says, having begun in the spirit, are you now made perfect by the flesh? Well, Pastor P, let's hear what Philippians Amen. 1, 6 Amen. has to say and Hebrews 3, 14. Philippians 1, 6, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun the good work in you will perform it or continue until the day of Jesus Christ. Wow. And this is what Paul is saying here to the Galatians. It was the Spirit who started the work. It was God who initiated salvation in you when you believed. And by the way, the faith that we used to believe in Jesus was granted to us by God himself. The Bible says God has given to every man a measure of faith. So the entire salvation thing is a gift from God. Even the faith that we use to believe in God is given to us by God. That's the beauty of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so Paul is saying, remember, 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 you started in the spirit. You cannot continue in the flesh. The same spirit who started in you is the same spirit who has to continue the work of salvation in you. Many times as Christians, we get frustrated. We look at our failures as Christians. We fall into sin and the more we try, the more we try, the more we keep failing. And sometimes we're ready to give up. Paul says, it is not about you. The person who started the work in you, God, let God continue that work in you. Let him perform that good work in you. Praise God. Amen. Amen. You know, Pastor P, before you go to Hebrews 3.14, I'm thinking of an analogy here because I'm thinking, don't let go of God's hand. You're foolish to let go of God's hand. And I'm thinking of it in the context. You're a drowning man. You're going under. And there I am reaching down my hand to pull you up. And the minute your nose gets above the water, you let go of my hand and say, let me go. Let me, let me paddle my own canoe now. What is going to become of you? The reason you were drowning in the first place is because you couldn't do it on your own. Exactly. exactly. And now, now the help has come. Yes. Let the help save you completely. Hail, hallelujah. That's salvation. That's hallelujah. salvation. Hallelujah. And so Paul, we again have this beautifully expressed in Hebrews chapter 3, verse 14. We are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. What's the condition there, Pastor P? <laughs> hold steadfast. The what? The one who began the work. Yes. With full confidence. Hallelujah. Hold steadfast unto that mm -hmm. until the end. And mm -hmm. so with these three verses of scripture, we are seeing the same principle being presented. The one who began the work is the one who's going to continue the work. The one who continues the work is the one who's going to bring the work to an end in perfection and that's not us that's god it takes someone outside of us to complete the work of salvation in us but don't be mistaken god calls us to cooperate with him to submit to his holy spirit and to allow his holy spirit to do that perfect work in us amen pastor p i just love every phrase in that passage for we are made partakers of christ partaker to share in to have in common that's the kind of near having the very life wasn't that what we talked about over in romans 8 29 conform to the image and paul says it in another way i think is in colossians christ in us the hope of glory that's it that's it that's it i think we said this a few weeks ago paul the battle of the gospel never stopped for Paul. In one way or the other, he continues to present the principles of the gospel. It is Christ in you. That's the hope of glory. Not our good works, not our obedience to the law, not our trying to be good. It is Christ. Christ and his perfect righteousness 
in us is the glory of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So it is not Christ's wish that we be bamboozled or we be bewitched or that we be beguiled. For he has given us the gospel truth. And again, here we are seeing set forth that when trouble arises in the camp of God, when there are false teachers trying to lead people astray, the thing to do is to return people to the gospel of Jesus Christ, Christ and him crucified. And therein, pastor, therein is the cure for any bewitching, any bamboozling, any beguiling that the enemy will bring our way is to return to the gospel of faith in Jesus Christ. You know, many times when we read this passage of scripture where Jesus says, in the end time, if it were possible, even the elect would be deceived. And we come to the conclusion, well, the elect knows the prophecies and the elect knows the doctrines of the church. Uh, saints, that's not what it's about. The elect know the gospel of Jesus Christ because the elect know Jesus. They are in relationship with Jesus. Their confidence is not in the flesh. Their confidence is in Jesus Christ. The full confidence of the end time church has to be Jesus Christ and him crucified. That's why the elect will not be deceived because they are wrapped up, tangled up and tied up in Jesus. Wow. Amen. Pastor, there is a song that I, I love. I'm not a singer, Pastor P, so I can't sing it to you. But it, I just read you one stanza and then I'll read you the chorus. And this is my mantra and I know it is yours. I care not today what the morrow may bring. If shadow or sunshine or rain, the Lord I know ruleth over everything and all of my worries are vain. Here comes the chorus. Living by faith in Jesus above, trusting, confiding in his great love. From all harm safe in his sheltering arm, I'm living by faith and I fear no alarm. Pastor P, take it away. This is your job. An awesome way to bring this to an end this evening. To remind us, saints, that we walk by faith and not by sight. We walk by faith and not by works. Our confidence, our full confidence needs to be in Jesus, in his life, his death, his burial, his resurrection. That's our righteousness. And many times we feel puffed up. Many times we feel good about ourselves. Because we know the doctrines or because we attend church on a particular day or, or we understand the prophecies. And we feel good about those things. These things are important. These things have their place. But may we come to know Jesus in a better way. May Jesus become our everything. May Jesus become our full confidence. May we lose all confidence in the flesh. And may we simply hold on to Jesus, whom to know is life eternal. There may be somebody listening to us tonight. You've never, never encountered Jesus. You've never surrendered to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. You've never been in relationship with Jesus. But you've heard the gospel. You've seen Jesus crucified on the cross. And you want to say to Jesus tonight, Lord, come into my heart. Lord, wash away my sins. Lord, save me. If that is your desire tonight, we pray that you allow Jesus to come into your heart. And if you've done so, there is some information on the screen. Give us a call. We want to know about that decision. We want to help you in your walk with God. And tonight, we want to pray for you. So will you pray with us this evening? Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we lift up that man, we lift up that woman, we lift up that boy or that girl. As they're thinking about surrendering to you, may your Holy Spirit tabernacle with them a little longer. May your Holy Spirit lead them to Calvary. May they see Jesus high and lifted. And may their souls reach out to Jesus Christ. May their hearts be opened and allow your Holy Spirit to reign supreme in their lives. May they surrender to your Lordship. Father, we pray that every one of us will seek a closer walk with you. We'll seek a closer encounter with you. We'll come to know you in a better way. We'll lose all confidence in the flesh. And may we have full and complete confidence in Jesus Christ and his righteousness. We thank you in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Amen and amen. Well. Thank you so much for studying again with us here on Ask Your Pastor on Whispering Hope. We trust that tonight's broadcast, the Spirit of the Living God, would have spoken to you and you are following His lead. Until we come your way again next week, same time, same place, God's willing, we wish you a pleasant evening and may God continue to bless you. Bye now.